We'll start off with some introductions. I'll just introduce myself and then I'll have uh, Windsor and Monica introduce themselves as well. Uh, my name is Scott Ozorowski and I work in the study abroad office and I help coordinate all of the first year study abroad programs. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have you all here today to learn about our, our brand new program in Ecuador that we're really, really excited about. Um, I'll have the two of them introduce themselves and I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of first year abroad just for those of you who don't know as much. Um, I think we've got some students here at different points in the process. Some of you may have already started your application, others have not. But I'll give a little bit of an overview, then I'm gonna have Windsor talk about the course and the program in some more detail, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some of the logistics of applying and cost and all of that. Um, but yeah, Windsor, why don't you go ahead? Hi, I'm uh, Windsor Gear. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I uh, study how organisms diversify and how they adapt to changing environmental conditions. And my uh, research is primarily on freshwater fishes. I, I study freshwater fishes in Northwestern South America and especially in Ecuador. Excellent. Monica, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Monica Ramos. I am honored to be the staff professional along with, the, uh, with Dr. Winsor Aguirre. Um, I, um, uh, serve in the Egan office for urban education and community partnerships under the Stein Center. Uh, I hope you're familiar with the Stein Center. Um, and I um, have been working here at the Paul for about four years uh, in different capacities. So uh, this time, I'm really glad that uh, I'm part of this uh, of this group. Thank you. All right. Let me give just a little quick overview of first year abroad programs, just so everybody's kind of on the same page about this. Um, what's really unique here at DePaul that not a lot of schools have is opportunities for students in their first year to go abroad for a short study abroad experience. And what we have done is build these into the focal point seminar class, which is LSP 112. And it's a class that most first year students have to take in their winter or spring quarter. Um, there are a handful of, of exceptions, um, theater, music students, some CDM students don't have to take that. Um, but for those students, they still are able to do this first year program and they're able to use it as elective credit or get their experiential learning credit for it. Um, honor students do not have to take an LSP 112 course as well, but we have a, an articulation with the honors program so that you get honors credit for this. So if you're an honors student, you will absolutely get honors credit for this program instead. Um, we do occasionally have some sophomores who are able to do the program as well. Sometimes as a sophomore, you may not have taken a focal point seminar your first year and then you're eligible to do it. Um, or if you are a sophomore that is interested and wants to get the experiential learning credit, if there is space available, we encourage you to apply and, and to be considered. So, uh, and the way that this works, um, and we're gonna get into some more detail, but in general, um, it is a four credit course that you will be taking in the winter quarter and then as you go abroad, the abroad experience will happen over spring break for about a week and a half. And that's an additional two credits of work um, for that time over spring break. Um, but so you'll be in six credit hours in the winter quarter. That was four credits for the LSP 112 class, and then two more credits for an LSP 250 class that is your study abroad experience and the assignments and the participation that goes along with that. Um, and so in general, that's sort of how things work with the first year abroad program. It's one of, um, um, six programs we're offering this year, and most students will be taking these LSP 112 courses in winter and spring quarter. Um, but doing this program, the bonus is that, you know, when the course ends and it's spring break time, instead of going home, you actually get to go to Ecuador for a week and a half. So, all right, Windsor, why don't you go ahead and go through the program? And um, if anyone has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat as we go. Unmute yourself and ask. Um, you know, we want this to be informal. Uh, we'll also have time at the end for questions, too. So, Yeah, and... Um... If someone could help me with the chat monitoring, Scott, yep, I know you can see it. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the chat, so. Yep, um, I'm on it. Great, um, okay, let me start. So um, like I said, I'm an evolutionary biologist and I, I conduct my research, uh, all of my field research really right now in, um, in Northwestern South America. And so um, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting time to, um, to be a biologist because uh, we're going through some uh, pretty, dramatic changes um, in the planet's ecosystems and the changes, um, many of them are for the negative. So uh, biologists have proposed the name Anthropocene for this geological epoch uh, to highlight the impact that humans are having on the planet. Humans are such an important force 
um, in, in every ecosystem on Earth, um, from the deepest portions of the oceans to uh, the tops of uh, the poles, um, we're such an important um, uh, force that every other species is being forced to adapt to us. Um, there's a, a lot of people on Earth, so we're approaching 8 billion people with a B, 8 billion with a B. And as a consequence of the number of people um, that um, exist, uh, these people um, are utilizing an enormous amount of natural resources. Um, and it varies um, by with economic status. So people in the United States, for example, will um, uh, consume very, very, very large amounts of natural resources to sustain our lifestyle. Um, so this uh, exploitation of natural ecosystems and human population growth is resulting in what's been called um, the sixth extinction, a mass extinction event of uh, populations and species that um, is um, comparable in scale um, to the um, five previous major mass extinctions that have happened naturally over the history of life on Earth. Um, so in this focal point seminar, we're gonna work on trying to uh, understand uh, the um, the biodiversity crisis. Um, we're gonna, it's, this is a, a seminar that's gonna run in the winter quarter. Like Scott said, we're gonna meet Fridays from 2.30 to 5.45. And um, it's gonna be a primarily discussion-based course with readings and research and presentations. And then you're gonna, you're gonna write um, a review paper on this topic. Um, and we're gonna examine the biodiversity crisis from um, three different, uh, from three different points of view, uh, from the biological, economic, and from an ethical perspective. Um, we'll also, we'll be reading um, materials from a number of sources, but one of the, uh, the primary book we'll be using is um, The Sixth Extinction, uh, which is uh, which was written by Elizabeth Colbert and does a really good job of, of um, summarizing where, where we're at. So biologically, um, we're gonna learn about the nature of biodiversity first. So what is biodiversity? Um, how is it distributed across the planet? How do we go about measuring it? And why does it matter? Uh, what is its role in, in um, our planet's health? We're also going to discuss some of the factors that um, are causing the modern extinction crisis. And so we'll talk about um, some of the major causes of uh, the decline in biodiversity. We're then gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about um, the issue from um, an economic point of view. And so people usually aren't just, you know, kind of, you know, evil people that are trying to uh, kill animals and plants for no reason. Usually they're economic drivers, economic forces are at play that are causing the overexploitation of natural resources. Um, so we'll talk about those and look at, look at, look at some numbers related to, you know, kind of how, how these economic factors um, originate and how important they are. Um, we'll also talk about how biologists and economists are actually collaborating uh, to try to put a monetary value on biodiversity. And so the idea is um, biodiversity contributes services to humanity. Uh, these are called ecosystem services. They're things like clean water, like um, people in, in the Chicago area get clean water from Lake Michigan. Uh, they provide clean air, they provide food, um, they provide um, a place, uh, uh, a habitable place for humans to live. So how do we go about, let's imagine we cut every forest and drained every lake on earth, every river. How would we go about calculating what would be the cost of actually replacing those natural ecosystem services that are provided for the planet by free, for free, with services that are generated by human beings. So giant water purification plants instead of um, conserving the land to have relatively clean water and things like that. So what would be the cost? Um, and so we'll talk about that. Then we'll end up talking about the ethical, um, the issue from an ethical perspective. So what, what is, is there an ethical argument for conserving biodiversity? Why should we care about other species? Can an ethical argument be actually effective for um, for um, making an, uh, for making the case that we should conserve other species? 
So we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to be going to Ecuador. So I'm uh, my family is originally from Ecuador. I lived in Ecuador for 10 years when I was younger. I my undergraduate degree is from the University of Guayaquil in Ecuador, and I do research on the freshwater fishes there. So um, so I go all the time, and um, I we're it's it's a it's a great place for this type of course because it it happens to be one of the most biodiverse countries on earth. So it has it's a it's a relatively small country on the Pacific coast of Northwestern South America between Colombia and Peru. It's about the size of the state of Arizona. So it's relatively small for a country, but it's incredibly diverse. They're very, very different types of ecosystems in different parts of the country. So in the um, Western region, so the Western region, there are these lowlands west of the Andes um, that um, have both some of the most beautiful beaches on earth, they're very beautiful beaches, and also mangrove ecosystems, then wetlands and some dry forest inland. Uh, the Andes Mountains are um, some of the highest mountains on earth and they have very steep gradients. So as you go from the low lying areas up to the top of the Andes, you go through um, a shift in the environmental conditions and you have some of the most biodiverse um, habitats on earth um, changing with with elevation and so um, the um, uh, bird diversity is a pretty extraordinary in the Andes Mountains in Ecuador and Colombia because the bird communities turn over as you go up and um, and then I forgot to mention in western Ecuador um, very 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 high levels of endemism meaning that it's a small area but uh, the species of animals and plants that occur there tend to be restricted to only occur there, maybe going a little bit into northern Colombia, uh, into southern Colombia and northern Peru. But many of the animals and plants are restricted to a very small geographic area. And then on uh, the eastern side of the Andes, this is um, rainforest, some of the richest, uh, uh, most biodiverse rainforest on Earth including one of the sites we're going to visit, Yasuni. Um, and so if you look at this map here, the small one, uh, this, this is Ecuador on the red, this little red you know, spot over here. Um, the forest here is part of the Amazon forest, which is covering a, a good chunk of Brazil. And the rivers in this um, eastern region, they drain the Andes and they cross all of South America to drain in the Atlantic Ocean. And so the, the communities here, um, there's a shift with elevation, but as you get to lower elevation, the rainforest is really, really uh, high in, in biodiversity. Um, unfortunately, all of these ecosystems that I'm, I'm describing are pretty severely threatened from a number of different factors. Some of them are common across these areas, like deforestation. There's deforestation problems everywhere. There's contamination problems pollution problems everywhere. Some of them are restricted to particular areas. So for example, um, one of the sites that we're gonna visit in the rainforest, Yasumi, is over an enormous deposit of oil. And so um, the oil has been exploited in um, Amazonian Ecuador since the 1970s. And oil represents Ecuador's largest export product. So for its national budget, the greatest proportion of the income in the budget comes from oil extraction. So you happen to have these enormous oil deposits underneath some of the richest and most biodiverse um, spots on earth, which is in causing incredible friction with, um, with um, some of the indigenous people that live in the area and people that care about biodiversity. And there are other, there are other problems um, in the, in the um, um, throughout freshwater ecosystems, there's overfishing, um, there's problems with um, uh, microplastics and, and other forms of pollution in the ocean. So there's a number of, a number of issues throughout um, the country. Um, so we're gonna, so we'll do the, the seminar in the winter quarter and we'll have academic activities. So we'll, it'll be largely discussion-based and we'll be doing some research into, so we can talk about the topics. Um, and you'll, we'll have some presentations and you'll have a review paper and that'll happen in the winter like a normal uh, focal point seminar. But then in the spring break, we're gonna take 10 days um, to travel to Ecuador. So we'll leave um, at the end of finals week and then be there 
we would both weekends, spring break and both weekends. And we're gonna travel through these um, diverse ecosystems. So we're gonna be on a little bit of a, um, uh, an expedition here. Um, and we're gonna visit very different places. So we're gonna start off by flying into Quito. And then Quito is the capital of Ecuador. It's high in the Andes Mountains, about 2,700 meters. And then we're gonna go up from Quito to explore the high Andes, a reserve in the high Andes, which represents uh, Paramo habitat. Uh, much of this habitat is above the tree line, so you have smaller plants. Uh, very important ecologically um, ecosystem, which has Ecuador's national bird in it, the Andean condor, uh, spectacled bears, um, all sorts of interesting animals, uh, but is being threatened by, um, uh, by contamination. Uh, there's issues with glacial melt melting from global warming, and uh, as you go down a little bit lower, there's pretty severe deforestation and pollution. So we'll start there. From there, we're gonna travel to um, the rainforest. We're gonna go down to Eastern Ecuador to Yasuni National Park, and we'll visit Yasuni and we'll spend um, several days there. Uh, we'll visit an indigenous community there. They'll, they'll be our host. And then we will um, do several activities to learn about the problem. Well, to see the biodiversity that exists in the region. So we'll see all sorts of animals and plants, parrots, their jaguar there, their anacondas. I can't guarantee we'll see, you know, the big predators, uh, but the, the locals will cer certainly tell us about, about them. Lots of birds, lots of insects, uh, lots of small mammals, very rich um, fish communities, um, and very, very dense forest, incredibly biodiverse. So in parts of the rainforest, you know, every tree you see in your site will be a different tree, basically. Uh, very, very high diversity levels for the plants. So we'll, we'll spend uh, several days there and then we'll learn about the biodiversity, but we'll also hear from local people and from scientists about the threats to this biodiversity, um, including the oil extraction, um, the overfishing, deforestation, um, encroachment of humans into these, into these habitats and the conflicts that cause it. And then we'll uh, end by um, going to the beach. So uh, from the rainforest, uh, the end of the trip will be, we'll, we'll um, uh, travel to um, the Pacific coast. We'll go to the Matalia National Park, which has very beautiful beaches. And uh, it, we'll visit an island called Isla La Plata, which is known as the Little Galapagos. It's not the Galapagos Islands, but it's, um, it's a very um, interesting island with huge seabird colonies, very large colonies of blue-footed boobies, magnificent um, frigates, and we'll do some snorkeling there and you'll have some time, uh, downtime at the end at, 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 and the beach habitat. And then we'll learn about the threats, you know, obviously overfishing, there's concerns about ocean acidification, you're increasing carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, pollution, plastics, microplastics in the ocean. So um, we'll learn about, about those issues there. And so very, very different types of ecosystems to give you a, a broad view of the types of challenges that our planet is facing in, in this little, you know, mesocosm and, and over uh, these 10 days. And so I just have like um, uh, the um, itinerary here. So um, so you get a sense of this. We'll go into Quito. And then um, the, uh, th these are color coded. These are in the Andes Mountains. So it's yellow. The rainforest is in, in the green. And then we have a, a travel day here. And then we'll be um, in the... Um, Parque Nacional Machalilla and the beach in the blue in Puerto, in Puerto Lopez. And so it'll give you a sense. So we're going to be moving quite a bit. Certainly, you're going to be seeing uh, very different things in these different areas and learning about very different people and different problems in these different areas. All right. So um, should I give that up to you, Scott? Yeah, sounds good. I'll do a couple slides just with some logistical things and then we'll open it up to any questions that people may have. Thank you so much for such a great overview of, of the course and the program, Windsor. Um, so I know a number of you have already started your application, which is excellent. Um, applications are due by November 1st, but I would strongly recommend get it in before then. Don't be waiting until the, the night before at midnight to submit it. Um, for the application process, for those of you who haven't, oh, sorry, I, I cut and pasted something wrong from the Ireland. This says start application on the FY Ecuador page, that should say. Um, 
But if you haven't started your application, just go to the Ecuador page on our website, and then there's a little apply now button that you click, and that gets you into our study abroad portal where you'll be able to create an application. Um, when you do the application, there's a main questionnaire that just has a handful of questions that are pretty straightforward about why you want to do the program, um, how it kind of relates to your time here at DePaul. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. You can work on it and save it. But then once you're done and everything is filled out, make sure to hit the submit button to submit that questionnaire. We also require one online recommendation, um, typically from a DePaul professor. Um, I know you're new at DePaul. So, uh, you know, oftentimes your, your discover or explore professor or staff professional is happy to do that. Or if you have another professor from this fall that you start to get to know a little bit. Um, if not, because you're new students, um, we will accept one from a high school teacher or a high school counselor as well. Um, it doesn't, it's not a full recommendation letter, so it's nothing hard to do. Basically, in your application, we ask for their email address, and then an email link gets sent to them, and they just answer a few questions online. So it's a pretty quick process. It's not like asking for a full recommendation letter. And then once you have submitted your application, the last part of the application process will be a brief interview. Um, Windsor and Monica will be contacting you to schedule the interview process, and those are typically small group interviews for just 15, 20 minutes. Um, it's nothing to be stressed about. It's just a chance for them to get to know you a little bit, ask a few questions about why you want to do the program, and just kind of get a sense for, for everybody who's applied to the program. Um, we can accept up to 20 students on this program, and some years we have more people who apply than there are spots, and so it, it can be a little bit more competitive. Other years, um, we don't have quite as many people as there are spots, um, so we're not sure yet how this will go. Um, but if we do have more people than the 20 spots that are available, uh, we will let you know that. And, um, you know, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll have a small wait list uh, with students who still may be able to get a spot, um, or we'll let you know about the other first year programs that might have spots open that you could consider as well. Um, but our goal is for anybody who's qualified and wants to do the program, we want them to be able to do a program, hopefully their first choice, um, but if not, potentially like a backup choice. In terms of scholarships, we do have scholarship funding for these programs. We have scholarships for all of our study abroad programs, but we have special additional first year scholarship funding. And there is no separate application. So as long as you complete your program application by November 1st, you're automatically gonna be considered for scholarships. Um, there are times when we may extend the application deadline a week or two if we still have some spots available in the program. If we do that, that deadline is not extended for scholarships. So if you wanna be considered for scholarships, you have to apply by November 1st. Um, the amount of these scholarships range. Um, we look at your financial situation, working with the financial aid office, as well as your academics. Because you're new students, you don't have probably a GPA here at DePaul yet, but part of the application process asks you to upload a high school transcript. Um, so we look at your um, transcript as well as your financial situation, and the scholarships range from $1,000 up to some of them being almost the full cost of the program. Um, so we do everything we can to try to help with scholarship funding. Uh, there's no application fee or anything like that to apply for the program. So if cost is an issue, I always say apply for the program, see if you get accepted, see what kind of scholarship funding you might get. We'll let you know all of that in mid to late November. And once you've heard that, you can then decide, great, I'm going to move forward or, you know, I've decided not to. Next slide, Linda. In terms of costs for the program, as I mentioned before, you have six credit hours for this program, the four credits for the, the focal point seminar, and then two additional study abroad credits, and those will all be registered in the winter quarter. Those appear like just regular courses on your transcript, so you do not pay any extra tuition for that unless you happen to go over 18 credit hours in your winter quarter. Um, just like any quarter, if you register for more than 18 hours, you have to pay for the extra credit, but as long as you don't go over 18 credit hours, um, there is no extra tuition cost for doing this, and they're just going to look like regular classes. Um, and we actually will register you in those classes. So you can't register yourself in these classes. So what I tell students is one of two things. As you're doing your planning for your winter quarter right now and working with your academic advisor, you can either leave a spot in your schedule knowing that this is hopefully going to be coming, and we'll register you in these classes. Or you can register in another course, either another focal point seminar course or some other course, just in case you decide not to go or um, you're not able to have a position. Um, and then if you do get a spot, you can just drop that course or we'll swap you out of that course into this one. So it's up to you what you'd like to do is kind of as you prepare for your winter quarter. Um, the cost that you will have to pay is the program fee. And that program fee for this program is $3,175. Uh, it includes almost everything on the program. It is your airfare. It's all your accommodations. It's basically just about every meal on the program, except one lunch and one dinner. All your activities and transportation, health and accident insurance. So really almost everything is included here. 
um, aside from, you know, personal spending money, some food and snacks outside, um, you know, if you have to get a passport or any visa fees or anything like that. Um, but it's very, very comprehensive. And as I mentioned, those scholarships range from 1000 up to potentially almost the full program fee. So even those smallest scholarships, if you get one of those, it's a third of the fee knocked right off. All right, last slide, please. And then, yeah, just um, if you have questions moving forward, our homepage um, is right there for the study abroad homepage. There's tons of information on there. We have an office in the Loop in the Daly Building, and then our office in Lincoln Park is in the SAC Building, both on the fourth floor. If you haven't been to the Ecuador webpage yet, that page has lots of detailed information about the program, too. And I have both of our emails there. You can feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, and yeah. Now I guess it's time to just sort of open it up for any questions that you have about the program, about the process. Um, so throw something in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask a question and we'd love to answer whatever you got. And I know we gave a lot of information, but we can't have answered every single question. There's gotta be some questions out there. Oh, maybe, here we go. Um, are students outside STEM and environmental science programs less likely to be accepted? Um, I can talk to that and Windsor can speak up as well. Um, the focal point seminar is not something that has anything to do with your major. Um, every student that's taking a focal point seminar comes from all different majors. So unlike some programs that maybe are more targeted towards you know, students who are further along in their progress as a junior, um, this is not a major specific course. So um, the point of the focal point seminar is that it takes a topic and looks at it multidisciplinarily from different points of view. So yeah, we are hopeful that we can, we're gonna have students from all different types of disciplines that apply and, and we absolutely will sort of treat all that um, fairly and equally in that respect. What we're interested in is why you're interested in the program. Whether that's your major or not, if you've got an interest in this topic and it's something you're excited to explore, that's what we're most interested in. And uh, from a biologist's point of view, it's. Um, one of the nice thing, one of the things that I really liked about these types of programs is it does, it gives you the opportunity to, to interact with students who are also in, in other fields that might not, you know, be um, uh, necessarily interested in a career in biology, or maybe, maybe you don't know you are, maybe you are, and you just don't know yet, um, you know, things change. But, but uh, students that wouldn't uh, have exposure to these types of, um, you know, these types of topics, it's exciting to be able to, to reach students in other um, disciplines. One thing I'll mention too that I hadn't mentioned before, um, you know, this is also an opportunity for you to, to get a great a study abroad experience your first year, but it also doesn't have to be your only study abroad experience. About half the students who do these first year programs go on to study abroad again before they graduate. So if you're kind of in, in doubt of like, oh gosh, do I want to just do this my first year? We have tons of other opportunities, lots of students who do multiple programs before they graduate. Um, and this is a great way to get connected with some other students, with a faculty and a staff member, and, and kind of meet some people in this first year and get a taste of study abroad and open up the doors to some more opportunities down the line. Other questions? Uh, which specific honors course this class fulfills? Yes, for honors students, this basically can count one of two ways. For most honor students, you still have to do a scientific inquiry course um, at some point. So this would fulfill your scientific inquiry um, requirement, or it can just go towards one of your honors approved electives. So one of the, those two items is where it fits for the honor students. You're welcome, Sydney. And if you're an honor student, you're going to see that you will still be enrolled in the LSP 112 course, just like everybody else. But I forward a list along to the honors advisors about all the students who are doing the program and anybody who is an honor student, they will go ahead and modify things in your degree progress to make sure it counts towards the right requirement. So you won't have to do anything. We'll work with the honors advisors and they'll make sure to put the course in the right place in your honors curriculum. Other questions? Well, um, feel free afterwards. Um, if you want to email me or email Windsor, we're happy to answer any questions. We're excited that you all came. I know a number of you have already started your applications, so keep moving along on those. And then once you have submitted those, like I mentioned, uh, Monica and Windsor will be in touch to set up those small group interviews. And uh, we're excited about you being interested in the program and hope to see you on it. Any other yeah, final thoughts from 
Yeah, don't, don't forget to fill out the application before November 1st so you qualify for um, financial aid. Yes. So, exactly. so try to do it sooner rather than later. And, um, and we're very excited about it. I think this is going to be a, a great program. And uh, I'm very excited about, about hopefully meeting some of you. Monica, anything yeah. from you before we wrap up? <laughs> yeah, I just want to say um, uh, study abroad opportunities are or could be life changing. And I am an example of that. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully, to join us. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting you and tell you the story uh, about a life changing um, opportunity for the study abroad. Uh, it's, it's an amazing. Amazing life experience. So hopefully you do take you take that. All right. Thank you everyone.